This is an Nexus Special, Episode 46, WWDC 2016, on June 13th, 2016. And now, don't worry, our version numbers are still safe. This Nexus Special is hosted by Brian Mitchell and Ryan Rampersad. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash NS46. Hello. Hello. Well, this has been quite a day. Yes, it has. It's been the, the annual Worldwide Developer Conference in San Francisco, California. Which we are not in. No, unfortunately. Maybe sometime, but not this year. And it's almost better in some ways, at least for the keynote and tracking everything, not being there. Because you can you can stream it and be on Twitter all at the same time and not be crammed to your phone or having to see in person. Right, you know, and you don't have distracted. to, and you don't have to pay eight thousand dollars to attend. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it's the cheap. And now that there are streaming uh, events and things, you can get a lot of the stuff without paying any money, which is a handy way. And yeah, this is more accessible. this is the best of all worlds. Yeah. So, you had mentioned that you didn't quite see the whole keynote. No, I did not see the whole keynote. I was I was in a meeting. During most of the keynote, I did watch, not listen, just watch, the first part of the keynote with the uh, watch and watch improvements. So that was, that was uh, as much as I saw. Now, if anybody else wants to actually watch the full keynote, it is available just hours later in high quality uh, at the link provided, first link in the show notes. Yes. So I was able to watch it live. So I... I saw it in its entirety. They it started off with Tim Cook on stage giving a moment in silent a moment of silence for the um, victims and their families of the shootings that happened uh, yesterday morning in Florida. So mm-hmm. that was a good good opener. Definitely. Um, then they jumped right in. They went to a few stats about the App Store. I think there are two million apps in the App Store now, so a whole lot to compete with if you're launching something new. And then they talked about watchOS, tvOS, macOS, and iOS. That's a lot of OSs. A lot of OSs, yes. And then um, this, uh, their State of the Union for the platforms was later in the afternoon, which I watched probably two-thirds of, and some other things that have been released on the internet on their developer portal and things I saw on Twitter for people using the betas and things. But you want to get into new features and yeah, let's start with watchOS. Yeah, so this would be watchOS three. This is a a pretty substantial update, I think, and it, I was quite pleased with everything they announced. So the the biggest, I guess, the biggest noticeable difference right away is improved app launching. So they store some apps in the background, and they said app launching can be up to seven times faster. So. They had an example where they tapped on an app and it was it was right open after the animation of it zooming in. It's right there. So that, that's that's been a big annoyance in Watch OS in version one and two. Mm-hmm. It takes a long time. They also have what they call a dock. So I think this this replaces kind of the old contacts view where you would press the button on the side and see a circular fan of contacts and their pictures. Mm-hmm. And that would let you um message, call, or draw to someone. But now it's what they call a doc. So this is a, a list of apps that hor- is horizontally scrolling that you can view and choose the order of. So I guess your quick shortcut. And I think that makes more sense for a single access button than contacts. Mm-hmm. I never ever used the contacts feature. So took them a little while to get it out, but I think it's good. Uh, they also had some new features on message responding. So if you're replying to someone, you can have just a, it's a list view. So you can have predefined responses to send back, or you can do something new, what they call scribble. So this is where you're, you can write a little box and it'll uh, transcribe it to a character. So you can, I guess, like handwritingly draw on it and make characters. And that works for English and Chinese. And so that a new way of inputting text. So it's, I guess that's about as, keyboardy as the watch can get and i think that's something it's more than what we've had in the past with which has just been speaking it but that's not always good to do in public not always possible yeah 
Um, they also added a SOS feature. So this would be on anywhere in the watch. You can hold down the, the single button, the same one that's used for the dock, that mm-hmm. you keep holding it down, and it'll, it'll give you an alert saying it's going to dial 911 in 3, 2, 1, and then it will call it. You can do things, I think, share your location. Um, so I haven't looked into it since the keynote, but a way of calling 911, alerting people that you need help, and I think that's a good safety measure to have. Definitely. Um, they also let you do activity sharing. So this is a way of adding competition to uh, your normal activity, so calories, exercise minutes, and standing minutes in a day. So you can view other friends who also have Apple Watches and see their progress. You can view their rings and see how many calories and steps and things like that. So that adds another layer of encouragement to keep going when you can compete with your friends. Mm -hmm. In addition to the health here, they they added an app called Breathe, which lets you do or guides you for uh, lowering your heart rate and doing breathing exercises. Yeah, I saw this on the uh, website, and uh, you know, it's it sounds gimmicky, but it's kind of cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to trying it out. I think it'll be fun to do, and you know, it's it's a nice variety between all of their other fitness apps and something calmer. Yeah, because everything else is just like, go, 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 go. Yeah. Push, push. And this is just slow down. Mm-hmm. Relax. Yep. I think it's a good contrast. Definitely. Um, they released more APIs for fitness apps. So the, the SDK will now offer up support for the gyroscope, the heart rate sensor, and extra speaker. I thought some of this was already available, but apparently I was wrong. So that is good. And I think we'll have a greater amount of fitness apps that are more concentrated towards single things. So maybe lifting weights, for example, Mm because Apple's Apple's own workout app doesn't have anything for that. Yep. You have to do other. Um, On the topic of activity, they also added wheelchair support. So if you have marked that you are in a wheelchair or a wheelchair user, you can instead get reminded every hour to, to roll. Hmm. So it tracks our movements. They did some studies on different, uh, ways that you can propel a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. So different arm motions, completely in a circle, semicircle above the top. I don't know. These are not technical names, but um, so it'll it'll alert the user for that and track that. That's so really that interesting. Good, good accessibility there. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And then lastly, they had uh, a face gallery. So this would be, I believe, in the Apple Watch app on your phone that would show all the different watch faces. So they expanded on this and have more faces available, some different customizations you can do. They added a, a activity category of faces. So this would be it really emphasizing the activity rings, showing how much you've done in a day. Mm-hmm. Some offer complications as well. So I'm very excited. I think there's some solid improvements and I can't wait to try it out. So do you think any of these um, kind of improvements would be benefiting from newer slash better hardware? Um I'm not really sure because we've we've only seen this. So maybe I think, yeah, faster CPU would be better. And I think even slimmer would be better too. But I think even though all these new features are using probably a lot more power, I think the battery in the Apple Watch, I have the 42 millimeters, so that's a little more than the 38. Mm-hmm. I think they, they have enough or beefy. Their battery they use is large enough that I don't think it will be a problem. And so... For now, at least maybe in the future, they will add more. I think additional sensors and things can definitely make the watch better. But how it is today, I think it's going to be okay. I don't know. I think the watch is going to be more of an Apple TV-like device where they update it every couple of years. Yeah, That's that, that seems to make sense. On the other hand, I think a lot more people would pay attention to and you know, early on in the improvement curve right now because it's new enough. And then over time, they can slow it down. Yeah. yeah we'll have to see what happens. Mm-hmm. Speaking of uh, tvOS, let's talk about that one. Yeah. So this uh, received some updates. Not a lot, though. So um, just going off here. So they have a single sign-on. So this lets you sign in once with your Apple ID. And I'm assuming you would set up cable channel access and things with your Apple ID account on a phone or computer before setting up your Apple TV. So that way an app can use single sign-on to make sure you are who you are and they provide the content for you. Because currently you have to 
log into your computer, put an authentication code on a per app basis. So for ESPN, you open the tvOS app and it says, all right, go to this URL, put in this code and then come back here and then it will have authenticated your account and single sign on it um, tries to remove that. So it's much more streamlined mm -hmm. and that's, that got some cheer and I think that's a very good step. Makes sense. Um, they also added a uh, dark appearance. So I think there'll be a global light or dark theme, which kind of changes their translucent, which has been more of a white translucent to make it more of a black translucent. And that makes sense, especially for TV viewing. You don't want as much bright white. Yeah, I think it's a very good touch, and hopefully apps will support it. And Yeah. Yeah. Um, Siri can search other apps now, so you can say, uh, search this in YouTube, and it will go to YouTube and put something in the search field there and hit return or whatever, and perform the search. So this is, you can, uh, I think, use apps by name and look for content on there. So this kind of follows the theme of the day where they expand Siri capabilities. Um, they have a new remote app on iOS that more closely emulates the, the Siri remote. Mm -hmm. So their gyroscope and things are usable via the remote app. And on there's a now playing screen that shows album artwork and has like a 10 second forward, 10 second backward thing, similar to the Siri remote, except for the album artwork part. But. And they redesigned the photos and music app to match changes in iOS, which we'll get to. And apps can require a game controller so previously they had to always support the Siri remote, but now they can explicitly require a game controller to work. So this will allow for more console-like games to come to iOS if people have controllers. Well, so it's still, I think it's promising, but we'll have to see how many people use their Apple TV for gaming. Yeah, I, I can't imagine the market is very big, especially right now. Yeah, I think consoles definitely have big... Uh, advantages of her Apple TV, but for light gaming, you know, all it takes is one big game to actually get onto the Apple TV, and then there you go. You're, it's a, now a platform. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. So um, I'm excited for Apple TV OS. Nothing too much. I don't think it'll affect what I use my Apple TV for very much. I mostly use it to watch Plex. So mm -hmm. as long as it does that, I'm I'm fine. Yep. So next, they discussed macOS. Yay! So this, uh, they officially rebranded it. It's macOS with a lowercase m, all one word, so M-A-C, capital O, capital S. And they call this one Sierra. And it does use the version number 10.12. Oh, good. So don't worry. Our version numbers are, are still safe. So they have some new features added. It's a little more feature featured than tvOS update, but... Uh, is definitely dwarfed by iOS and watchOS, I think. Maybe watchOS. It's a little different of an operating system, so hard to compare. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, the name is officially official, as I tweeted. Um, but uh, some important new features are auto-unlock. So if you are uh, already authenticated with your Apple Watch, it will auto-unlock your Mac. So you wake it up. Instead of typing in the password, it just uh, pushes through and shows your, your desktop. It's pretty so cool. I'm not quite sure... How this works, if you have a phone that's unlocked in your hand, will it also unlock your Mac? I Hopefully. wasn't, I never followed up on that, so that'll be interesting to see. But it's using continuity, so, so you would it, have a, could it be a newer based? Mac. Yeah, I, I believe it's Bluetooth. Yeah. Using their similar technologies as AirDrop mm -hmm. and sharing handoff continuity between iPhones and OS X. That's okay. I'm, I'll just type so in my password phone. because I'll never Not, have an iPhone. Hey, you never know. <laughs> That's true. I don't know. <laughs> you uh, maybe that iPhone seven this fall will be yeah, so you could, great. You could you could you could you could double check that in uh, November, and I'm sure I suddenly we'll just it'll, have yet another phone. It'll go well with that Hackintosh you're going to build, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, I believe in you. Don't worry. I I've, know. I've seen friends who have completely flipped around. Well, I, I think I would probably just have multiple phones at that point. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You'll pull a, a Marquis Brownlee and just right. have insane amounts of phones yep pretty much so after unlock uh they went over and discussed universal clipboard so this is you can copy anything on an iphone ipad or a mac and it will go over icloud or continuity i'm not quite sure probably continuity and transfer then to your other device so if you copy an image 
for example, on your iPad, and then paste it and hit paste on your Mac, it will copy that image to the Mac. So this is this is something that has uh, third-party apps have long tried to bridge the gap with because oftentimes you have a little something on your phone and then you realize, I need a computer to finish this up or to use this. And so I what I've done is I've gone into Notes, pasted it there, opened Notes on my Mac, opened it there, or I messaged it to myself, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. So this this finally bridges that gap, and I think it's a long time coming, and it's good. Lots of people were tweeting at Paul Haddad of Tapbots saying "Rip Pastebot," which is a app I think from 2010. It hasn't been in the app store for a few years, but it there's a little demon that ran on a Mac, and using your iPhone and Mac, you could share a clipboard. Yeah, it's a pretty handy thing. I agree. Yeah, and so they have improvements to iCloud Drive, so it can now store documents on the desktop and documents folder and have optimized storage. So they provided an example of a machine that had 20 gigabytes free. They turned on all the optimizations, and then it had 150 gigabytes free. So it uses it looks for documents that you haven't accessed in a while, don't things you don't use very often, and will remove them from your machine, but have them available to download on the fly if you need them. Mm-hmm. So this... I don't know how I feel about this. I might use it. I might not. I think probably more towards the side of not. I know I have several Git repositories in my documents folder, for example. Yeah, and I'm sure and your iPhone think... totally wants to deal with Git. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think it may not be a feature for me, although maybe I might turn it on for some folders and that might be good. But Because yeah, I was, I was noticing the other day, I was trying to clean up a bunch of storage on my computers and iCloud Drive is sitting at 4.2 gigabytes because I have documents in there and it there's no way to delete it from the device but not from the account. So hopefully this will have some more fine-grained things, maybe like Dropbox where you can say sync this folder but not this one. Or not sync but store. So we'll see. Mm-hmm. Another thing is they announced tabs. So this it sounds like some apps that don't even need to don't need to do anything to support it. So the standard tab that you see in Finder or Safari will be or can be used in an application. So say in Pages, you have multiple documents open. You can instead have it be in tabs instead of Windows. So another way of being more productive. I think this is pushing for using full screen apps because you can't really switch between Windows when you're full screen. Right, yep, that makes sense. If you have multiple documents, you'd want to switch between tabs versus Windows. So I think... The full screen users will definitely use that. You know, it's a it's a classical Apple thing to make a big deal about adding tabs. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of funny, you know. Yeah, I remember when when Finder had tabs, there yep. was a whole bunch of cheering, and I'd use a third party utility to have it before. Right. Then, yeah, and I'm pretty sure Classic Windows Apple. Windows Explorer has tabs, but nobody uses it because it's awful. Yeah, well, it's strange. I think I used Total Finder or something else. And it used the Chromium style tabs in Finder. And so it's just like a very strange mix between Google and Apple. But that is uh, many years since I've used that now. Right. So they also added picture to picture. Again, something else probably for full screen support. So you can have two apps open and have a video running. So this is just, you take any HTML5 video that supports it. Mm-hmm. Um, you can put it in a picture, resize it, drag it around. How, like about, a, uh, how about a YouTube video, for example? Uh, maybe. We will see. I think YouTube supports AirPlay from their player, I want to say. So uh, maybe they do support, they will support this in the future. Um, yes, YouTube does support AirPlay. Oh, Just that's amazing. Now. This is going to be a wonderful change. So I do think they'll support picture-in-picture. Picture. Good. Good. Um, at least on the Mac, although, you know, they might want you to use YouTube Red. We'll see. We'll see. It's a little different, though, because it's not in its app. It's in a right. website. So That's what I'm hoping. Little, I, I would hope that they support it. Mm-hmm. Um, a, there, one more thing was Siri coming to uh, Mac OS. So this is an application that's in the dock or a little uh, menu bar thing that you can talk to Siri with. Um, it kind of uses things in Notification Center, which I thought was a little strange. So it'll put results in an, I don't, maybe it wasn't in Notification Center, but in the area where Notification Center is, is where Siri lives. Um, 
so that little panel that would slide off really i think it just kind of comes down from the top instead so that lets you talk to siri you can ask it to search for images on the web just drag an image into keynote for example mm -hmm. that was a demo they did to which everyone on twitter was complaining about image licensing but Pointers. another story yeah <laughs> so uh, and there's more context now, so you can search for something in your in Finder, for example. So you can say, "Look for files uh, sent from this person in the last month," and it'll show you that. And you can say, uh, "Only use ones with the tag work," mm -hmm. and we'll refine it again. So Apple's adding some more AI deep learning into Siri and context. So I think it's finally pulling Siri towards. Uh, Alexa and Google now, which is definitely had been in the in the ahead of Siri last year or two. Um, another interesting thing is the Game Center app was removed from OS X. Huh. The, the developer guidelines say that if an app is using Game Center, they have to now support and have to have the UI for showing leaderboards and things like that, and for a multiplayer. So, I think that's good. Game yeah. Center on OS X was a strange looking app and I don't think anyone really used it. I'm pretty sure that's how most people feel for iOS also. Yeah. Though there was a time when Game Center was still new, the iOS five, six days, yep. I actually used it quite a lot just for looking at, at things, adding friends. I still have like fifty five friends at Game Center. It's a I lot of I know, people. I don't think I know anyone who's even close. Okay. And that was back in high school when people had iPod touches all the time. Yep. Everyone had their the iPod Touch for games, mostly. Like, uh, Google Play has a, an application similar. I don't know what it's even called, because that's how useful it is. And, <laughs> you know, games will try to implement it, but then you can also just hit skip, and then you just never use it again. And I don't I don't want to share my scores. I don't want to do any of that. Yeah. And all of the top scores in every single app are people who have hacked, hacked their games and set the, you know, the max value for a 64-bit integer to be their high score. Great. And you know, the top 50 are integer max values. What is that, like 20 quadrillion? Two, it's like two quadrillion or something like that. Yeah. Two, you know, one, six, four, I don't know, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, cool feature was they opened up uh, the use of iCloud for non-Mac App Store applications. So you have to have a, a signed developer certificate for it. But uh, it's finally kind of is look making it that I think they're just trying to get more people to use iCloud. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a good way because requiring for a Mac app store, people have to do some hacks. Uh, one password was able to use the iCloud by using their, the JavaScript web version of iCloud data storage and building that into their objective C or Swift application. And so that's a lot of work. And now developers can just, do it the right way mm -hmm. from the beginning without having to go through the Mac Astro. Makes sense. And then finally, there's a, a link of uh, technical changes um, going through the OS. Um, so, and I think there's additional support for color spaces and more things if you're interested, including yeah. I've seen many links to API diffs and everything. And those are crazy long and little too in depth for something like this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> lots of stuff though. Yeah. Take it, take a minute to look through it. If you can, it's, it's fun. Um, then iOS 10, 10, iOS 10, the big one. And this is using a one zero, not a, not a capital X in Roman numeral style. So hmm, that is a shame. They, I think have, uh, separated themselves from Roman numerals now. The, so. the, the Roman numeral 10 never happened. Yeah, you mean the OS X, right? Right, <laughs> right. The X never happened. Yes. So the iOS 10 uh, tagline on their site is big, bold, beautiful. So it is, I would say it is big, bold, and debatably beautiful. So Debatably. I, I mean, that's, that's every person's opinion. So starting off, um, new lock screen. So this... Uh, uh, let's you they they said the the wall the wallpaper on your lock screen you know when you have notification on iOS nine below kind of dims it it has like a a grouped 
scrolling notifications section on the screen mm -hmm. and the background's dimmed. Now there each notification is like a panel box with little rounded borders. It's a translucent white. Unless they have a dark theme, which they might announce in the fall. Who knows? Hopefully. Um, hopefully. I saw Maybe. someone tweeted some swift uh enumeration value for a you know, dark. If they're thing, switching but... to an OLED panel, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. It would look really well. Mm -hmm. It would look really good with yep, that. Definitely. Um so we have these little white translucent boxes for alerts. Um, you can expand them and show some more. You can swipe to the left and look at widgets. I think these, these are the notification center widgets, the today widgets, um, but it kind of pulls it in a little more with just a swipe away because it kind of keeps it at the same place versus a uh, own overlay that would have been notification center in the past. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a good touch. Um, and apps can now use a ringer alert. So the, the swipe to, to answer. Previously, you'd get uh, just a normal alert saying like new WhatsApp call, but now you can swipe to answer. Mm -hmm. So that's a good touch. So following on the Siri improvements from Mac OS, uh, iOS also gets Siri improvements. So they, they've they offered um, new APIs and including opening up Siri for third party developers. So you can control things, compose things, do Siri things with all of your applications which I think is a long time coming. Everyone saw it, and here it is, finally. So it's Very good. good. Um, they added uh, some AI deep learning to QuickType uh, and in Photos, and I think this kind of goes with Siri. So it is, it is intelligent and smart about viewing um, context. So they had an example in Messages where someone's saying, do you want to go eat here? Sure. Uh, how about this day? OK, how about this time? Great. So it was, uh, broken between messages between different people. And um, if you tapped any one of them, the, the calendar um, modal that came up would have all that information filled in from the multiple messages. So that's a good example of it looking through and finding context. Mm -hmm. um, now, also in the Photos app, um, you can search for things. So similar to Google Photos, you can just search beach. And then a whole bunch of beaches will come up. And if you've been to beaches, and have photos of them. So I think it uses prior location and just image processing. But this is all done locally on the device. So when you first get iOS 10 and you open the Photos app, it's going to take a little while to scan through everything and analyze it all. Mm -hmm. But it's local to your device. And they were very, um, they stressed that a lot to make sure that the privacy is known. So it's just a new device, not uploading it to Apple servers. Right. Um, that's about all I have here for photos, deep learning. I think there's more that is there, but I haven't looked into it quite enough yet. Um, maps improvements. Uh, there are third-party uh, app extensions for maps. So this would let you do something like uh, get an Uber to where you are, um, make a reservation at a, at a restaurant, all from within the map. So if you or searching, you find a restaurant, you could say, okay, order a table at this time for this many people. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Now, now get me here. I'm going to use the ride sharing. Okay, just book an Uber. It'll be here in two minutes. Great. And you can pay with Apple Pay in line, all from within the map application. You don't have to leave it at all. Great. So this sounds good for those restaurants and people who use uh, Uber and ride sharing. I still think they need to push for more cities to get transit. <laughs> MSP. So <laughs> we'll see. They have a, uh, additional traffic and rerouting capabilities. So it reminded me a little bit of ways. So it can suggest this route is six minutes faster. Would you like to use this one instead? So you can use that. Uh, they also uh, redesigned the Apple Music or Music application. Uh, this was presented by a new person that Twitter seemed to like. Uh, her name is uh, Basmona St. John, and she, uh, someone called her Hair Force 2. Oh my. <laughs> so that was pretty good. Um, so she presented on um, the new application. So uh, songs will have lyrics now. Um, it was redesigned a couple different tabs. Um, your My Music section is on the left, and you can see playlists, artists, songs, things like that. Mm -hmm. And you can also see, um, rather than a, a, a strange, um, 
list coming up from the bottom with a little toggle, you can have just another uh, table cell that would take you to the same thing, but just of music that is local to your phone or device. So you can, if you have offline stuff downloaded, you can just view your offline. Cool. Which is, which is good. It's a little easier than the current way. Mm-hmm. Uh, this app was full of a lot of uh, heavyweight use of the San Francisco typeface. Mm-hmm. So it just looked a little strange. Things are pretty large. And the connect tab was missing, which makes me think it just got pinged, which is Apple's previous attempt of a social media- music network. Oh, that man. That failed. thing was the worst. I, I used it a little bit, but, yeah, it shouldn't have existed. I don't really use Connect. I wish I wish it was more simple and I didn't I don't care to see what artists are posting about themselves. I just want to see the only thing I want to see is um this playlist was updated, this artist added new songs. Yep. Nothing nothing else. I don't want to see inline things about who buy our new merchandise. I just want to see a list of changes more or less. Yep. And that's not really what a Connect field would do. And so we'll see if that goes away or not. Uh, next, I went through messages, and wow, was that an update? It so, is huge. Yeah, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at this too much, but they just kept going and going and going with new features. So to begin with, uh, if you just send an emoji, it is triple-sized, so uh, kind of matching Facebook Messenger. I found that a lot of this was similar to Facebook Messenger. That's my biggest messaging app that I use that's not iMessage. Mm-hmm. So I'm most familiar with that. And they and I think that's what they're probably trying to compete with a little bit. Um, you can also send stickers. Uh, and this can be done through third-party applications. Um, in the uh, later presentation about their platform, State of the Union, they had a, a quick example of a sticker extension. And it seemed pretty good. They can animate. You can paste them on top of another message. Um, so that's iMessage apps. Um, you can emojify, which is what they called. So when you type a message out and then you go to the emoji keyboard, all of your words that are an emoji will turn orange, and you can tap on that word and it will replace that word with an emoji. That's pretty so cool. So if you, if you type, type, I'm going to go walk my dog and then go to the graduation party, you know, mm-hmm. you, it'll, you can replace walk with a walking person, dog with the dog, uh, graduation with that grad hat and party with the the party popper or something. Yeah, like that's that. perfect. Yeah, so it's really. Uh, I think we'll start to see confusing paragraphs of text here with random emoji inserted in. It sounds great, though. Someone was saying they hope they have a, a reverse emojify so everyone's grandparents oh. can can understand what their grandkids are talking about. Yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> Maybe there'll be an iMessage app for that. Who knows? Hmm. Um, then there's, that's, that's kind of, uh, I guess predictive emoji kind of similar, but this would be in the, in the quick type bar. If you're typing something that is an emoji, uh, it'll suggest an emoji for you. So the, the keyboard keyboard does this. And I believe the, um, Samsung keyboard on Android does it. I don't know if the like, Google keyboard does, but suggesting emoji to use. Uh, you can reveal messages in uh, cool new ways. So there's an invisible ink attribute. So it'll kind of cover an image or a link or some text. And you can kind of swipe away on it and it'll just kind of dust will fly off and reveal what's underneath. So that's a, a way of kind of surprising something. There's more of a gentle reveal where it, it starts small and then grows into the bubble. Mm-hmm. There's a kind of a pop where the big, the bubble, or these are, I guess, bubble effects. So the, the the bubble that you sent your message in will kind of start two or three times the size and rock back into its normal size and stationary. So there are a couple others. I don't remember them off the top of my head. Um, so there's also a- big animations of keywords. So if you type, I guess, birthday or happy birthday or something and send that, a whole bunch of balloons will fly out of where that message is across the screen. So um, there's another one where they sent three emoji and there was a big like laser show coming. It was behind all the messages. So it was like a background replacing the white background of the view Mm -hmm. with this little laser show for a little bit. So there's some animated backgrounds on keywords or things you can put in. I wasn't quite sure they demoed that pretty quickly, I think. Uh, You can do handwriting as well. So 
uh, you can send a little um, drawing or text that you write, and it kind of settles in the ink. So you can, I guess, quit, watch your ink dry and soak into the paper on your virtual phone screen or something. I don't know. Cool way of saying thanks or something if you wanted to draw it out. Yeah, and you had good handwriting somehow. Yeah, that's true too. <laughs> and finally, I believe, or almost finally, there's tap back where you can do reactions to messages. So you can do like a thumbs up, thumbs down, exclamation mark. So this is a little like a little badge on a message yeah. so you can react. I, I think really that would like be it. good. Yeah, it's it's kind of like in Slack where you can react with an emoji. I love that. It's like this. Only it's five or six options. Yeah, I think reactions are really cool. It's a good way of getting in large group conversations, quickly seeing what people think of it. Yeah, and it doesn't pollute the main chat either. Definitely, yeah. So this whole messages thing, what I think is really cool is at Google I.O., there was a big announcement of Google's new chat application called Allo, which is a horrible name, and the application itself is horrible, but it's funny to see how much overlap there is between that and this. So this lacks a lot of those contextual, like, oh, you were searching for food? Well, here's some more food. So it does have, though, like the way you chat uh, changing. So it can make text bigger, it can make things wobble, it can make you know, emoji appear in weird places. And so it's interesting to see how both companies sort of tuned into that same undercurrent. Like this is how messaging will evolve. Yeah. It was, it was interesting seeing some older developers on Twitter really complain about this and some younger people saying, Oh, this looks cool. I think it's really seeing what Snapchat and Facebook messenger have done in the last year or two about enhancing chatting applications, mm-hmm. and I guess, Slack lately in a little less dramatic way. I mean, I will, I, I kind of agree with some people that I want a chap, chat application just to be good at chatting, but this doesn't take away from those things. It's not like it's forcing you to talk in emoji. It just gives you the option. Yeah. Um, yeah. I should also note, uh, there are rich URLs. So you paste the URL, it'll show you a little preview of it or, image if it's an image that you're linking something like that so similar to slack or facebook or something yeah that's good um and then also there's a per contact read support so you can per contact or thread probably say send read receipts for this don't send it for this previously it was all or nothing um yeah so next on the ipad they discussed swift playgrounds so this was a this is an application on the iPad that lets is it seemed like it was intended for kids to learn how to program. It's a little uh, instruction or lessons, little animated guy to to jump around, collect gems. So that could be learning about making move forward and collect gem method calls, and then looping to go in a circle or something like that. So a good way to learn programming, but. I have a feeling a lot of developers are going to be using this for, um, I guess, you know, on the go, creating new things, doing some logic. I think it'll be quite fun to see what people do with it. Now, there's an application called Pythonista, mm-hmm. which uh, Steve Struffin Smith uh, a couple months ago was really into because you could import uh, some Objective C runtime. And so you could, via Python, make a bunch of iOS calls. And there, he was able to read the root file system and things from this sandboxed iOS application. And so I'm curious to see what people are going to be able to do with Swift Playgrounds, because it's a little more native. You can import Objective-C at the top of the file. You can import UI Kit and Foundation, and probably maybe Quartz Core and other other big libraries. So you can do a lot of powerful things. The SDK is available to you. Um, and you can load views on your device and things that you make. And so I'm, I'm very excited to see. I will probably use it on my iPad to learn more about Swift and Definitely. developing for iOS. I think, it's, I think it's interesting that they decided to do this, you know, instead of making any other tools available first for, like, the Mac. Like, I know the playground already existed there, but they could have developed it further. But instead, putting it just on the device is pretty neat. I think they're doing this because a lot of schools are getting iPads for students um, 
Yep. And and kids, you know, their parents get them an iP- an older iPad that they watch a lot of videos on, play Minecraft on. I know I I know of many kids who have iPads and not really computers, and they use that a lot. Mm-hmm. I think this is this is targeting what they think kids are using more often than not. Definitely. And I'm curious to see what Ian thinks about this and if he would use it as in his class because everyone has an iPad already. Yeah. I think that'd be really cool. I think, I think that is a really good point that education uses, uh, instead of having to load, you know, a third party kind of like, uh, what do you call it? Um, what are those, uh, scratch or those other yeah. kinds of things onto either computers or to somehow get it to work on an iPad. This is a great, great solution. You know, it, it indoctrinates the people into the, uh, Apple languages and it just happens to be available also. Yeah, and then it's free. They have lessons from the first coding. I think people could really go at their own pace yep. and figure it out. And Swift and is I a think, great language too. No, no, no doubt about that. Yeah, I, I've really enjoyed. It. I think it's a good first language too. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be pretty exciting to see where it goes. Um, so I was ten. Definitely drop support for the iPhone 4s. Yay. The keynote says it. Uh, did not mention the iPad mini, iPad Touch 5, iPad 2, or iPad 3. However, on Apple's website, it does mention that iOS 10 does support those devices. So that's a little bit in limbo, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm really hoping they do drop it all, though, because those those things have been around for too long, and they need to go away. Yeah, if, if those were dropped, it would mean that uh, every single device that iOS 10 would support is all Retina, because mm-hmm. the iPad mini... And iPad 2. And those are A5 devices. They're five years old at this point. Yeah, it's, I think it's it, that's too long. It's over. Yep. Yep. So another big change that I think is going to change a lot of things that people are very happy about is the unbundling of stock applications. So this, these still come on your device, uh, but you can remove many applications from your device after you install. The Apple site does say they take up only about 150 megabytes, so they're not too large but you can remove them to uncolor your screen, things like that. I'll quickly list them because I have them all here. So there's calculator, calendar, compass, contacts, FaceTime, find my friends, uh, home, I guess that would be the home kit app, um, iBooks, iCloud Drive, iTunes Store, mail, maps, music, news, notes, podcasts, reminders, stocks, tips, videos, voice memos, watch app, and weather. So these are a lot of applications that some people use, but a lot of people don't. And so I think it's good that you can remove it yep. and still be okay. Now I will note uh, defaults are not implemented or not yet or haven't been announced or maybe they're waiting for this fall. So for example, if you uninstall the mail app and you tap a mail to link, a alert will come up saying you need to install the mail app to open this link, even though another app could very well su- uh, support that with the defaults. Yeah, that does seem like something that should be added at the same time as this was removed. Mm-hmm. So, so I, yeah, I asked Evan Coleman this, I have a uh, tweet link here. He goes by EDC 1591 on Twitter. And he was saying, uh, it looks great. He thought it would work fine. I said, what about Meltu links? And then he tweeted this tweet mm-hmm. and said, Oh no. And I've seen a couple other people notice that as well. So I hope that there's default support. I think if they don't introduce it now, uh, there's going to be some awful hacks and annoyances from everyone until iOS 11 would, when they would probably say, okay, fine, we'll release default. Yeah, I hope or they don't wait that long because that would be awful. I I think it's time. Um, I think, you know, map applications, default music app, mail app, and web browser is probably important to have. Yep. And I thought it was interesting that they also have things like contacts, because I don't know anyone who doesn't use the built-in Apple Contacts application. Yeah, the, I, I the don't. The phone app has basically the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. And Contacts wasn't in iPhone OS 1. I think it was an iPhone OS 2 feature. Yep. But still, it just seems kind of strange that that's removable. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, otherwise nothing too surprising there. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Clock app is updated uh, got a, a dark theme, I guess. Didn't touch on this on our keynote or anything, but I saw tweets and people who use the beta. So you can set timers and alarms and things still, but there's a new bedtime feature 
which lets you um, put in when your bedtime is and when you're going to wake up. And it'll show you how many hours that is. And it will do some sleep analysis. And I'm assuming this goes to HealthKit. So then you can um, say, I'm going to bed now, I'm waking up now. And then it will put in the use of that long. And it'll give you, can give you a reminder of go to bed now, 15 minutes before or something. Um, you can choose the volume, a sound, and certain days of the week for that alarm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a nice feed. I'm going to be using that. I've been using a an app. Um, oh, what is it called? Federico Vitici wrote about it last summer, I think. It's called Pillow. And so that is an app that I have on my phone. So I set an alarm. It's my alarm. I have it plugged into my phone and put face down on my bed. And so it uses the proximity sensor to turn off the display, but the phone is running and listening. It records audio, which I can listen to in the morning if it hears me so the biggest new change i think is the announcement of the apfs so apple file system so this would be replacing their hfs plus which would be a hierarchical file system plus which is their extension in um, the mac os nine days i believe it was maybe eight so this is a new file system. It's uh, in developer preview in uh, Mac OS Sierra, and it's scheduled to ship in 2017. So it'll probably be present on uh, OS 10 or Mac OS. Oh, this could take a while. Mac OS Sierra. Yeah. But uh, probably not default. It In its current form, uh, it cannot be used as a startup disk. It is case sensitive only, which someone was saying in our technical forums, people were really. Not happy about that. I don't know why. It doesn't seem to matter to me. Um, Time Machine is not currently supported. Uh, File Vault is not supported. And Fusion Drives are not supported. Um, so these are all things that will be worked out and supported when it's uh, continuously developed here. And it's enough that it will be open source. Uh, the, the format and documentation will be released when it is released. So open sourced, mm -hmm. which I think is a good touch. Um, It'll allow for things like Linux to support at least reading or writing to it, maybe in the future. Yeah, that's, so it, that's an important thing. Yeah. So um, looking through it, it's it's an interesting uh, bit of new features. So it has 64-bit IDO numbers, which allows it to have um, uh, what is it like nine quintillion files on a single volume. Mm -hmm. So it's something huge, probably up from the 32 mega or 32-bit that it has now. A lot up. Yep. So yeah, nine quintillion files on a single volume. Um, there's nano nanosecond timestamp granularity, um, which is the improves upon the one second timestamp granularity of HFS plus. So uh, quite a bit different there. What is nanosecond millionth of a second or something? It's a billionth, I believe. A billionth. Okay. Yep. That is a big increase over one second. Um, extensible block allocator. I'm not sure what that does. Um, when initializing very large disks, a block allocator may lazily initialize its data structures only as necessary to improve to improve performance. Um, there are it supports sparse files. Uh, there's crash protection, so it does copy on write. But so I believe when you are copying a file, it or writing to a file, it will cop. It'll make a copy of it until it's done and then replace it. Yep. So you're not directly writing to data. And if something happens, that data is still there when mm -hmm. it comes back versus yeah. currently we have weird corrupt data when it's in two different states at once. Yep. Um, there are extended attributes uh, for file attributes. Um, there are built-in trim operations for solid states. So this is... Um, these operations are issued asynchronously from when files are deleted or free space is reclaimed, which ensures that these operations are only performed once metadata changes are persisted to stable storage. So stability. Mm -hmm. um, encryption is built in, or at least will be, doesn't support file vault, and it's, it'll support um, AES XTS or AES CBC, depending on hardware. And it looks like it can support um, no encryption, single key encryption, or multi key encryption. And it's pretty cool that it's per file keys. So that's very, uh, very, very secure. Yeah, at a, at a file system level, I think that's good. Yep. Um, it'll be uh, compatible with El Capitan and later. 
uh, Yosemite will not recognize it. Um, and it will be, uh, it can be shared on the SMB network file share, but not AFP, which is Apple Filing Protocol, which is now officially deprecated. Good. I think it was maybe last year. Very good. Um, yeah. So that'll be quite cool to see as it as it is built on. And so it can, it offers a couple new features as well. So uh, it's flash SSD optimized. Mm-hmm. Um, so the copy and write design is more tailored towards flash SSD because it has more um, IO to work with. So I think on a hard drive, you don't necessarily want that because it's spending more time working on the disk. Uh, there's a new feature called space sharing. So you make a container which um, allocates physical space on a disk. Um, and then in there, you have multiple volumes. But each volume inside a container will show the same free capacity. So they are dynamically filled. So currently, if you have, say, a 500 gigabyte disk and you have two partitions, you have to give a hard number when you make those partitions. And it will always be that number. Mm-hmm. Now, with, with HFS Plus, you can re-shrink a volume and resize, but it takes a while and it requires repartitioning. Where um, APFS, it will do it live. So if you have um, a 100 gigabyte container that has uh, volume A, which uses 10 gigabytes, and say volume B, which uses 20, the free space for both volumes will be reported as 70 gigabytes. So it changes how free space is done. And so you can, for example, I guess, put on a uh, beta OS. So let's say we're next year and you have, or two years when APFS is out and the next Mac OS beta comes out, you can make a new part, uh, new volume on this APFS container for the beta OS, because you want to have both, then it will dynamically use it and will, won't use more space. You don't have to say, okay, put a hundred gigabytes started and then always be down a hundred gigabytes. Right. That makes sense. So I think, I think that's a nice feature. I think, I'm not sure if other file systems support it, something like that or not. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, no. I think that's going to be a cool feature. Uh, that you can all do, also do snapshot, snapshots of... Snapchat. A, <laughs> Snapchat. That would be something else for a file system. Very different. <laughs> uh, so that would be a read-only instance of a file system on a volume. So this is probably a more file system-based way of doing a full backup. So that'll be interesting to see how it is. Yep. I don't think that's currently implemented. And there's fast directory sizing, uh, which allows APFS to quickly compute the total space used by a directory hierarchy and update it as the hierarchy evolves. So this sounds like just a lot more improved directory sizing reporting. Because currently, you know, if you go to your root level of your disk on an HFS plus drive and you hit command I get info, it takes quite a while for it to maybe not root level, let's say one folder in, Mm -hmm. it takes quite a while for it to figure out what's in there. It says calculating size, sometimes forever, it never really returns because there's so much to go through. It's Mm -hmm. basically indexing the whole thing. Um, You know, here's Finder running at a bunch of CPU time and my disk IO just went up to 10 megabytes per second. Anyway, this should improve that a lot. Sounds good. That's about what I got for APFS. Mm Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm a little like Syracuse and I'm file system happy. But No, that's it is something that we've needed for so long. But it makes sense they've waited yeah. until this long to do it because they needed to study how solid state drives worked and how people used them. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And you know, five years ago, yes, HFS plus could have been good there, but solid states were just coming out right. and they don't you know, solid states are definitely the future and we know that now mm-hmm. and it's just becoming more and more the case. And so yeah. Planning about around that is good. Mm-hmm, definitely. So I'm very excited for that. Another random feature is um, Safari 10 is has lots of new features. They didn't touch on this in the keynote, uh, which is a little unfortunate because that team has been pushing really hard. Um, um, there's ES, ES6 support. That's the notable feature. Yes, they were the first the first browser to uh, achieve 100% ES6 support which I think is... Give it to me. Give it to me now. Nice. You can uh, get it in the Safari nightly if you want the latest build or uh, technical preview on your MacBook. You can have it right now. It's going to be wonderful. I've I've been using the technical preview on El Capitan here, and it's 
worked pretty well. A couple issues with one password, but other than that, it's been good. Um, some other things, the, the ES internationalization API, I looked at a little bit of that when they were tweeting about supporting it, and that's super cool. Um, so you can give it like a currency code and a number, yeah. and it will yep. and it will just automatically format a string for you. That seems nice. Very impressive. It adds 3D touch events, um, some WebGL improvements, um, inline uh, audio video playback on iOS. This has previously only been on iPads. Does a video play inline on an iPhone? If you play a video, it would go full screen all the time. Hmm. You can now disable that, which I think is very nice. Um, it says videos without audio tracks or with disabled audio tracks can play automatically when the web, when the web page loads. That's probably thinking of GIFs or something like that. Mm-hmm. I think that's a nice feature because it has been quite annoying. Uh, I guess on Reddit when I'm looking at a GIF that has now been a GIF V format, which is essentially just a MP4 video, you know, it hijacks my audio and plays a a. There's no audio track on the on the GIF because it's a GIF, but it pauses the audio, plays it full screen, and just interrupts. And so I think it's about time we get inline video on an iPhone. Um, it supports picture-in-picture, um, WOFF2, which is the web open font format for greater compression, um, more CSS4, so the RGBA. Yeah, that's pretty cool. The hex format, um, additional right-to-left support, um, some unprefix CSS features like filter, crossfade, and image rendering. Mm-hmm. Um, and Apple Pay for the web for using Apple Pay via JavaScript, which will be interesting to see how that works. You would prove it with your phone or watch. So that'll be something. Well, it's very good to see the browsers going forth. Yeah. it's It's been very surprising how... So Safari doesn't get updated very much, but when it does get updated, it has huge updates. And I think that's because it doesn't get updated a lot. It seems like a lot. Yeah. Yep. And finally, the Apple Design Awards have, they've likely happened now by the time we are recording this. (laughs) Yep. Um, So there are, those apps have been released. I'm going to check them out tonight. Look for it on Twitter. Um, And we'll see, see how that they all are generally pretty good apps i actually haven't heard of too many here just looking through i've heard of uh, dj pro um i think i've heard of ulysses mobile uh text app um what's another one laura croft go i think i've heard of as well so those are some of the apps that have been announced and i'm sure those will be showcased in the app store in the coming days definitely so that's about what i have there uh I guess a couple other things. So Xcode 8 was released to developer previews, which contains Swift 2.3 and Swift 3. And that reminds me, I don't I have no idea what is in Swift 2.3. Um, I'm guessing some additional features, but not quite the big syntax changes that comes with Swift 3. Yep. Um, don't quote me on that, though. <laughs> so uh, some big some changes to the Xcode IE. There's a, a graphical memory profiling in an active debugging session. So you can see where memory is in like a tree. Um, and not just a normal, like a expanded list kind of tree, like a very graphical with lines and shapes. <laughs> very so, Apple-like. That sounds very impressive. Yeah, it, it, uh, you should check it out if you have the time. It's very, very cool. Yeah, that's, I think, about all I got, unless you have anything else to add. Well, what didn't we see? We did not see anything about hardware. So oh. those long-awaited MacBook Pros that we want so bad, they are not here. So. No no MacBook Pros, no Mac Pros, no no iMacs, no, no Mac Minis, nothing. Nothing. How sad. On the other hand, look at it in a good way. The Mac that you have is, is uh, less out, outdated than it would be if they did release new hardware. But if they did release new hardware, the <laughs> Mac I would have would be the new one. That's true. Patience. Q4, so hopefully by September it'll be out. I hope. Yeah, we'll see. I'm I'm sure it'll be okay either way. You know, maybe they just need to get their um, OLED screens together and, yeah. uh, you know, prepare for the future. I hope it's worth it, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. So compared now, to other WWDC 
events. How how do you compare this one? How do you rate it? I think this one is pretty good. Um, it's a little different because I have a little more uh, iOS developer experience at this point. So mm-hmm. I'm approaching it from a different style or a different standpoint. I just see all these new features and I'm just thinking to myself, oh my God, that sounds like the worst amount of features to support in three months. And now I really feel for all the developers every summer who are just struggling to support all these new features. Yep, that's why you go to the subscription model, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of the new uh, App Store changes, I saw tweets of ads in the iOS 10 App Store, and people were posting about Overcast, Mark Armit's podcasting app, um, with the ad for some, you know, like Washington Post above it. So when you search Overcast, so it's something that has nothing to do with Overcast is still showing up there. Uh, Paul Haddad of Tweetbot, uh, I think, tweeted or at least retweeted a tweet about searching for Tweetbot. And there on the top, or Twitter, not Tweetbot. So looking for Twitter, the very top is an app that claims to get you more likes on your tweets. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, so, I, don't, I don't like ads on my searches when they don't need to be there. Yeah. I think I could be okay if they are very high quality ads and they're all for apps that I think are very good. But I don't think... Apple will necessarily have an approval thing for apps, you know. That's that's pretty restrictive if they're only going to allow you to advertise if you're a quote good developer with a quote good app. Right, that's and that's too... and it's and it's like you know whose opinion is that, right? Yeah. So I was just looking. So so what what was one of the searches? It was just for Twitter. Yeah. So I just searched for Twitter on the Google Play Store, and there are no ads. Really. Yeah, so you That's just get Twitter good. as the top result. There are no sponsored links, no sponsored ads. There's nothing. So, hmm, it's funny how Apple picked ads up first in their store results. Yeah. So I'll say right now when I search for Twitter on iOS 9, the first app comes up as Twitter, then Periscope, owned by Twitter, then Tweetbot 4 for Twitter, great Twitter app that I cannot recommend enough, then get followers on Twitter, by a company called Instagram Followers Media, hmm. which has uh, over 10 times as many uh, reviews as Tweetbot. That and is then so Twitter bizarre. for five. And then Tweetcaster for Twitter, Tweetlist for Twitter. Now I should say Tweetlist still has iOS 6 style markup. And then Echophone for Twitter. So Great. Hmm. Yeah. Hopefully search is improved too. We'll see. Yeah. Um, one more note I'll say about Mac OS. So the last several releases of Mac OS, the same computers have been supported, mm-hmm. but now with Mac OS Sierra, um, the late 2009 or later MacBook and iMac are supported and the 2010 or later MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, Mac mini or Mac Pro is supported. So hmm. many of the 2007 to 2009 Macs that were compatible with El Capitan will not be compatible with Sierra. Like me and Brandon's MacBook Pro or MacBooks from 2008. Well, it has been a Seven. long time. Yeah, Eight and years I'm surprised they lasted this long. Time. To be honest. Yeah, I'm 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 pretty impressed. The MacBook Air was still included. The 2011 model. I mean, it's you know it's old. Yeah, and that 2010 one was even worse. Even worse. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's got to happen at some point. Definitely. I. I mean, my 2008 MacBook, I put the Yosemite uh, public beta on there and that, or I think it was developer beta actually. Uh, and that thing crawled. It was, it was bad. I can only really use it on LK10 when it's running very few utilities and just doing simple browsing mm-hmm. with a lot of patience. Yeah, that's why I always lag behind a version or two on OS X get better performance but you also lose on features i'm more of a feature person i'm i'm more of a making the macbook air work kind of person i mean that too and then the the, my macbook from 2008 at three years three three and a half years old i was already ready to replace it yeah and and i i did replace it in four years or a little under four years actually i think three and a half and it has it it has surprisingly still been able to run things. And I run, uh, I guess, Snow Leopard or Lion on there, and it runs so much faster than it does today. But back in 2012, I still couldn't stand that. Hmm. 
So I think that's about it. Yeah, I think so. I'll be looking out on Twitter all week about other things that people are discovering and learning about at talks and workshops. Speaking about Twitter, where can we find you? You can find me, especially this week, on Twitter at underscore Brian Mitchell underscore. I'll be talking about WWDC and Apple and retweeting lots of stuff probably all week. So that'll be exciting. And you can find me on my website at brianm.me and my other Twitter at bman4789 if you want to see what I'm doing that has nothing to do with tech. And of course, you can about- find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryanmar and of course on ryanramperset.com, which links to just about everything. Perfect. <laughs> That's where you can find me. You can also find me being very sad in the corner with my MacBook Air because I don't have a MacBook Pro. It's got to believe that MacBook Air is just going to love you all the more being able to be used for just a few more weeks or months. Yeah, with, uh, let's see here, with the 510 cycles. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I think uh, I'm curious what my my 2012 MacBook's at. I think it's at at least 500 cycles, though. Let me uh, pull up here. But it's nothing compared to my 2008 MacBook, which is in the 900, 940 cycle range. And is it about... 30% battery health. So Yeah, that's that's pretty bad. I'm at 80-ish here. Okay. That's that's 80, usable, but it's a little noticeable. Yeah, uh, 80 83% actually gets me just enough of the day that I'm okay with it. Okay. Do you bring it to work and use it there? Uh I I, I was bringing it to work, but then I had to actually start doing work and I stopped. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So my my um at 523 cycles. What yeah. did you say you were at? Uh, five, uh, five, ten. Okay. Well, I guess I use my computer a little more because mine's a, a year newer, too. Yep. I use mine very intently for one the first year. Mm-hmm. I think I had about 350 cycles or so in the first year. And I've used about, uh, what's the math here? Almost 200 since in the next three years. So... I was a very big user the first year. Then I built a desktop and then I neglected that MacBook. I mean, I would love to use, um, you know, a Mac as my primary secondary computer. But I can't use the MacBook Air for a lot of things these days because VMs actually require horsepower. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Soon. Macintosh. Yes, that too. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, coming on and talking to, talking about WWDC. It's always good. Yeah, always good. Until next year. <laughs> oh, oh, well, until the next special event, which is hopefully in less than a month because I need a MacBook Pro. Yeah, I will well, definitely. I'll yep. see you at that MacBook Pro special event. Great, perfect. And, you know, even if there isn't an event, let's do a Nexus special anyway, just reading the website. That is okay with me. With I'm full fine. excitement. We can make our own keynote. Oh, that would be awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds good. Have a good one. You too.